The Hyperion is easily the most popular choice between the four Witherblade variants, but regardless of which one you choose, it is no secret that a fully scrolled Witherblade is the ultimate mage weapon that one can possess. Its single target damage is super high, its DPS is unmatched, and the overall versatility of the Witherblade is incredibly useful for all parts of combat. But as you're probably already aware, this thing does come at a very steep price point, meaning that you'll likely have to work your way up to it with other weapons first. In theory, this sounds totally reasonable, except things start to get a little bit tricky when you realize that there are plenty of different mage weapon options that all vary in different strength, price, and requirements. As a result, the purpose of this video is to put all of the most popular and best mage weapons up to the test, to really see how strong they all are in comparison to one another, and thus come to a conclusion on which one you should get, and which one you should skip. So, with all that being said, let's just jump straight into today's video. To determine which mage weapons are the most worth it to go for, we first have to actually pick out the mage weapons that we want to compare. For this video, I've chosen to pick out the Spirit Scepter as the base starting weapon, and then the following upgrades to this will be the Glacial Scythe, Yeti Sword, and the Midas Staff. Now, while technically there are options before the Spirit Scepter, such as the Dreadlord Sword, a Bonzo Staff, or even the Frozen Scythe, these weapons get outclassed really early on. As a result, the Spirit Scepter is the first proper mage weapon that will have the potential to carry a dungeon gameplay straight into the mid-game stage, and it serves as the ideal benchmark to compare the higher-end weapons to it. Needless to say, now that we know what weapons we'll be testing in today's video, let's actually define what a good weapon is. This term can be very vague, so I've created some points that we can refer to for the rest of the video, and these are the cost of the weapon, the requirements of the weapon, the clearing potential that it has inside of dungeons, its boss potential inside dungeons, the raw damage number it actually produces, and then finally the DPS of the mage weapon. Now while I will be testing the damage of these weapons in respect to one another, I'd like to point out that this metric is usually quite useless for comparison, as clearing potential, boss potential, and actual DPS numbers tend to be a much more accurate display of how good a mage weapon actually is. On top of this, the cost and requirements play a huge factor in whether an upgrade is actually worth the money, or if you should spend the coins you would have spent on an upgrade somewhere else. I've also come up with these metrics with the purpose of only testing these weapons inside of dungeons as the only source of damage, because let's be real, most people lean towards playing melee outside of dungeons due to how much cheaper and equally good it is. At the time of making this video, the only properly viable mage weapon outside of dungeons is a Necron Blade variant, because while mage technically can hold its own before a Necron Blade, it's mostly comparable to its melee counterparts, except it tends to be anywhere between 2 times and 20 times more expensive than melee. This means that this video won't be covering weapons such as the Aurora Staff or the Voodoo Doll, as generally it isn't worth buying these since they have very low potential inside of dungeons. Lastly, because I'll be focusing on dungeon right-click damage or RCM damage, you're probably wondering if I'll mention or compare left-click damages as well. In a real setting, a mage will have an RCM weapon for clear and an LCM or left-click mage weapon in the boss. However, this usually isn't necessary before you get into master mode because RCM damage tends to be strong enough for both clearing and the boss. As a result, I will briefly touch on LCM weapons and LCM damage in some parts of this video, but the main focal point will be on the RCM damage that the mage weapon has. Nonetheless, now that I've covered how this video is going to be structured and what defines a good weapon, let's talk about costing and requirements so we can start doing some damage testing. The base weapon we'll be comparing everything to in this video is the Spirit Scepter. This dungeon weapon is generally around 15 million coins on average, and it can be upgraded using Thorn Fragments at an additional cost of around 30,000 coins. The Spirit Scepter has a Floor 4 completion requirement. Floor 4 is unlocked at a considerably low requirement of Catacombs 9, making it a very obtainable option for your average early game mage player. On the other hand, the Glacial Scythe isn't classified as a dungeon weapon, meaning that it can be used before entering the catacombs if you meet the requirements. Conveniently enough, it actually doesn't have any initial combat requirements, meaning that a new player can technically get their hands on one and then take it into dungeons, but that's assuming that they can actually afford one. 
This weapon generally costs around 50 million coins on average, making it over triple the cost of the Spirit Scepter. The Glacial Scythe can also be converted into a dungeon weapon at the cost of 50 Ice Essence, and if you choose to do this, you will need to reach Catacombs 10 to be able to use it in dungeons, but you can still use it outside of dungeons if you don't meet that requirement. This is technically very slightly higher to reach than a Spirit Scepter, but at such a low Catacomb requirement, both of these weapons are basically on par with one another. Moving on to the Yeti Sword, this weapon costs around 65 million coins on average, and surprisingly, it also doesn't have an initial combat requirement. It does have a Catacombs 22 requirement to use inside of dungeons though, which is substantially higher than both the Glacial Scythe and the Spirit Scepter, but it's also supposed to be a much stronger upgrade. Similarly, the Midas Staff doesn't have an initial combat requirement, but it does have a Catacombs 25 requirement if you choose to dungeonize it and then take it into dungeons. Unlike any weapon in this video though, it is the most expensive one by far. This is because you have to spend a minimum of 100 million coins on this weapon when bidding on it to reach its maximum potential. However, due to the high demand of the Midas Staff, it generally costs upwards of 300 million coins just to get one with that 100 million coin bid. Either way, to recap all of the costs and requirements of these weapons, we first started off with the Spirit Scepter costing 15 million coins with a Catacombs 9 requirement, followed by the Glacial Scythe costing 50 million coins with a Catacombs 10 dungeon requirement, then the Yeti Sword costs about 65 million coins and has a Catacombs 22 requirement, and lastly the Midas Staff has a 300 million coin price point and a Catacombs 25 requirement. Now that we've marked these points off our original checklist, let's just jump straight into raw damage tests to see how these weapons perform up against one another. So before we jump into any of the damage tests, I do want to cover a couple of important stats on my profile before I actually show any of the numbers. Now if you're familiar with any of the damage tests that I do on this channel, you will have a rough understanding that I don't normally test on my main profile. I either test on this profile here, which I call my second profile, or I test on this third profile that I have, which is a little bit stronger than my second profile. Now, the reason I like to test on this profile specifically is because, as you can see by the skills here, they aren't really that good, and if we look at the Catacombs skill, I don't really have a high Catacombs level either. Now, this is usually deliberate because I like to mimic my stats as close to an early or mid-game player as possible, as opposed to if I test on my main profile, you can very clearly see that this is a lot more maxed out and isn't as accurate to an early or mid-game player. That being said, unfortunately for me, the Midas Staff that I do own is soulbound to my main profile, so if I want to compare all four of these weapons in a fair damage test, I am kind of forced to use my Catacombs 43 main profile, and I just want to get that out of the way at the beginning of the damage test here to let you guys know that I am quite overgeared. I will also show the armor I'll be using in today's video, which is a very good three-quarters storm set with perfect gemstones. It's got G6, P6, and overall is quite well enchanted. And then the Wither Goggles I'll be using does have Legion 5 on it and is also quite nicely maxed out. However, bear in mind that this will not change how good each weapon is from one another. Even though my stats might be inflated towards an early or mid-game player, whether or not these weapons do more damage than one another will not change based off of my stats. So either way, let's just get started with the main damage tests. Alright, so I've gone ahead and I prepared this floor 7 dungeon with no blessings to get some simple raw damage numbers from all four of the weapons. Now, as you can see by the tab list, I do not have any blessings active, so this is solely just off of my Cata scaling and all of the other stats that I have on my profile. And if I quickly hover over all of the weapons I'll be testing in this video, they are very similarly enchanted. These two both have Smite 7 on them, while these two only have Smite 6. However, I don't think that's too much of a big deal because both the Yeti Sword and the Midas Staff are already so expensive that you likely will have Smite 7, but you aren't really likely to put Smite 7 on a Spirit Scepter, so it kind of made sense not to. Either way, aside from the fact that some have Smite 7, they have the exact same enchants nonetheless. All of them have Altwise 5. They are fully maxed out per weapon, so the Spirit Scepter is fragged, as you can see by the little symbol. I've also Fuming Hot Potato booked everything, 5-starred them, recommed them, etc, etc. Now, once again, to showcase all of my armor again, this is what all my stats look like with the armor that I am wearing. I will not be testing with any pets, just to try and keep this as fair as possible. 
And if I look at my talisman bag, I do have 1,469 magical power inside dungeons, but I do not have any intel scaling selected here. So this is just going off of my armor and the weapons. But either way, let me just blow up this crypt so I can test the damage of the spirit scepter to get things started. So if I blow this thing up and I shoot the undead, I did 1.1 million damage. If I go ahead and do the exact same thing here, I'm doing a solid 1.1 million damage with the spirit scepter. Now, if I move on to the glacial site to see how much this weapon does, if we shoot this thing, it's doing 800,000 damage. And just to verify that one more time, it is doing 800,000 damage. Now, moving on to the damage of the Yeti Sword, if I blow this up and see how much damage we do, we did about 7.3 million on that first hit. And if I go ahead and do the same thing once again, we're doing about 8.7 million damage, I want to say. I'll quickly just double check that. And after quickly reviewing the footage, it actually dealt 8.9 million damage, so it was a pretty substantial increase. Now, I actually did blow up two crypts prior to those ones that I've just blown up, and those damage numbers read 4.6 million and 9.1 million damage. I'm not really too sure why the Aether Sword is so inconsistent, but just based off of those four damage numbers, I'm going to say it does around 7 million damage, even though it seems to be very inconsistent with how much it actually deals. And now for the Midas Staff, I just want to show off as well that when I do use the Midas Staff ability, the gold blocks do not appear in the way. If you do want to toggle this on as well and you're using the mod Sky Tills, you can go ahead and check the config here, type in Midas Staff, and then there's an actual setting to turn off the gold blocks from rendering. But either way, if I blow up the crypt and then hit this thing really quickly, we did 17.4 million damage. If I do this one more time, we still maintain 17.4 million damage. So as you can see by these raw DPS tests, it's pretty clear that these weapons have some very different damage numbers. The really interesting one was the Yeti Sword not being very consistent at all. And I did blow up about six crypts in total to get some rough damage numbers. So it seems like it averages 7 million damage. But either way, the Spirit Scepter only did about 1.16 mil. The Glacial Scythe did 800k, which is quite underwhelming. And the Midas Staff came out on top with a whopping 17.4 million damage. However, while it does seem like these raw DPS numbers show that the Midas Staff is obviously the best weapon in this lineup, doing raw damage tests isn't really the best way of gauging how good a weapon is because it doesn't show off how good their DPS is, how good their clearing potential is, or all of the other stuff that I mentioned early on in this video. So in order to test all of this, what I'm going to try and do next is find a bunch of yellow rooms without any blessings whatsoever. I'm going to test all four of these weapons in a rough DPS test where I'll time it, see how long it takes and how quickly we can kill the mob. And that should give a rough estimate of how good the DPS tests are for each one of these weapons. So for the DPS tests, I went ahead and found some yellow room lost adventurers, and I made sure that I got to the rooms without getting any blessings along the way. Bear in mind that despite me keeping these tests as controlled as possible, I'm still ultimately testing on a Catacombs 43 profile that has really high end stats. And even though I didn't have blessings affecting the damage between tests, the lost adventurers all vary slightly in how much health they have, depending on which ones I found. Despite these inconsistencies, the following DPS tests should still give you a rough estimate on what kind of DPS you can expect from each weapon, which is why I'm still including them in today's video. Either way, to get things started, I first tested the Spirit Scepter against a Holy Lost Adventurer, and honestly, its health is getting drained quite fast for such a cheap weapon. The Lost Adventurer did end up pinning me against the wall, which forced me to teleport out and turn around, but even with the sudden movement change, I was able to retarget it quite quickly and maintain consistent damage thanks to the explosion radius of the bats. Overall, this isn't the most impressive set of damage that you can get, but for a 15 million coin weapon with a Catacombs 9 requirement, I think it's safe to say that this does the job extremely effectively. Moving on to the Glacial Scythe, this thing also outputs some solid damage onto the boss. Similar to the Spirit Scepter, I was forced to turn around after getting pinned in a corner, but I found it much harder to retarget my shots after turning around. This is because the Glacial Scythe's projectile is much slimmer and requires more precise aim, but all in all, it still works quite well and was able to knock this boss down really easily. This weapon did perform very similarly to the Spirit Scepter overall though, and if the boss had been a Holy Lost Adventurer instead of an unstable one, I feel like both weapons would have taken pretty much the same amount of time to kill, making them barely any different in terms of boss damage. 
Next up, we've got the Yeti Sword. This thing was substantially better than both the Glacial Scythe and the Spirit Scepter combined, as I was able to pretty much delete the minibus with just a few clicks. I did have a couple of issues taking knockback, which caused me to miss a few of my attacks, but if I was using a pet with a Shelmet, this wouldn't have been an issue at all. Overall, there's not much to say about this fight. It was quick, it was effective, and the Yeti Sword performed exceptionally well. And then last but not least, the Midas Staff absolutely deleted the Unstable Lost Adventurer. Considering it does literally 16 times the damage of a Spirit Scepter, this is exactly what I was expecting for boss DPS. All in all, you really can't go wrong with this thing for outputting pure, raw damage, and it's certainly the strongest option for taking down mini bosses. But now we've covered all four of these weapons' DPS capabilities, it's time to conduct the next set of tests, General Clearing Potential. Starting things off with the trusty Spirit Scepter again, this thing is an absolute monster. The Spirit Scepter quite literally steamrolls through all of the general clearing mobs with no problems, allowing you to pick up keys, blessings, and other dungeon loot incredibly quickly. Even though its miniboss damage is one of the worst in the lineup, it's still able to tackle the minibosses in these rooms super well. If you pair it with a few LCM beams to get some extra mana regeneration and bonus damage, you genuinely have an absolute top tier weapon, so all in all, this thing is a good contender for the clear tests. Moving on to the Glacial Scythe though, I can't really say the same for this weapon. Aiming with the Glacial Scythe is nowhere near as easy and seamless as the Spirit Scepter, and I was often missing a lot of mobs in this room. The miniboss damage it outputs was about the same as the Spirit Scepter's, so no complaints from that, but the narrow hitbox of the projectile and lack of explosions makes the clear a lot messier. I also found that I ended up just not comfortably taking out certain mobs with this weapon, and instead, I'd just end up aggroing a bunch of random mobs that would follow me around, which slowed down the clear a little bit more. Overall, the Glacial Scythe doesn't necessarily do a bad job at the clear, but it's certainly nowhere near as comparable to the Spirit Scepter or any of the weapons in this video. The Yeti Sword's clear was really interesting, because it reminds me an awful lot of how I clear with my Necron Blade. You can see that in this first room, I completely obliterated all the mobs and the miniboss in one go, progressing to the next room super easily. The actual damage and clear potential of this Yeti Sword is very strong, but my biggest pet peeve with it is that you have to block with your sword to activate your ability, which you end up doing a lot in the clear. If you get any minibus rooms, then this thing absolutely shreds compared to the Spirit Scepter or the Glacial Scythe, but for general mob clearing rooms, I'd still argue that the Spirit Scepter is a much better weapon overall. Nonetheless, I was still quite impressed with the Yeti Sword's performance, but it is important to note that it can be a little bit annoying to use, and its mechanics are a bit gimmicky. Last up, we've got the Midas Staff. When I was recording the clearing footage for this video, honestly, I was insanely disappointed and also mildly frustrated using this thing. Despite the Midas Staff literally having an insane amount of raw damage, if you even have the smallest of obstacles in the way, they still block the projectiles completely, and you have to recast the spell a bunch of times until you actually hit the mobs. You can see in this footage that the first room that I got was quite small and had tons of things in the way, and when you pair this with the gold blocks obstructing your vision, it makes the clearing experience a total nightmare. The following minibus room also had a bunch of crypts in the middle, which just caused more problems and made things more annoying, and I can personally say that this clear just sucked in general. Objectively, it is able to reliably one-tap all mobs that you encounter, and it bursts down minis insanely fast as well, but the overall mechanics and the feel of the Midas Staff just makes it such a pain to use, and for that reason, I'd put its clearing potential pretty low. And last but not least, the final set of tests that I have for this video are the boss tests. To do these as accurately as I could, I did bring a teammate with me to help me grab the crystals, crush storm, and complete terminals in the floor 7 boss fight, but I made sure they didn't bring an actual damage weapon into the fight itself so that I could take full responsibility for all necessary DPS. The blessings that I got varied across each run, but this is completely out of my control and it's just a minor inconsistency that we'll have to put up with. The boss tests still provide a rough idea of how these weapons fare against the Floor 7 boss fight, so all in all, while not perfect, these tests are still worth covering. If we start out with the Spirit Scepter yet again, this thing did a great job at clearing the Withermancers and handled Phase 1 quite well. 
Considering that I did a good chunk of DPS while still wearing my spring boots shows this weapon is certainly capable of holding its own. Max all DPS from the Spirit Scepter was also very good, taking him out really quickly and being able to progress to phase 2 with no troubles. Phase 2 was basically the same thing, clearing Withermancers wasn't a problem, killing the Shadow Assassins on the pads was easy, and my damage was strong enough to 2 cycle storm despite my mage DPS being the only source of DPS in this fight. Goldor managed to get around halfway through the tunnel before getting taken out, which is also quite solid for solo Spirit Scepter DPS. And then for the last phase against Necron, it was slow, it did take quite a bit, but I was able to chunk his health down slowly but surely and 3 cycle him very comfortably. The Glacial Scythe performed really similarly to the Spirit Scepter, so I'm just going to speed through this test to try and keep this video as concise as I can. Phase 2 clear was a little worse than the Scepter because of the lack of AoE damage, but overall it still performs totally fine. What wasn't fine, however, was the fact that I couldn't 2 cycle Storm like the Spirit Scepter did, and I ended up having to use the purple pad in this run. This could have easily been due to bad blessings or just a basic skill issue, but regardless, it's still worth keeping in mind that the Glacial Scythe struggled noticeably compared to the Scepter. This trend was further reinforced in Goldor Tunnel, where he got to a little over 3 quarters of the way before dying. Necron was also quite a poor performance as the 3 cycle was the same as a Spirit Scepter, but it just took longer. So all in all, the Glacial Scythe performed substantially worse than the Spirit Scepter. The Yeti Sword started out very strong with solid clear in Phase 1, wiping out Withermancers and bursting down Maxor very easily. Phase 2 was great as well, but as I mentioned in the clearing section of this video, it was a little bit more annoying to use than the Spirit Scepter because of the constant sword blocking that you have to do. Storm damage was completely fine unlike the Glacial Scythe and I was able to 2 cycle with no problems, so, so far, I'd say this weapon was very comparable to the Spirit Scepter. However, lots of problems started to arise in Goldor Tunnel. If you can't see it, my Yeti attacks are quite literally just not hitting Goldor, because he's hovering too high off the floor. It actually took me a while to realize this, and the damage that I was actually dealing to Goldor was solely coming from the really scuffed LCM damage. This is very important to note, because the Spirit Scepter didn't have any troubles taking Storm down, but the Yeti Sword's wacky mechanics absolutely did. This was even worse in the Necron fight, as I was quite literally launching massive chunks of terrain at him, and they just didn't do any damage because he was hovering in midair. I ended up just giving up completely and using my Necron Blade to finish off the job because this weapon was totally hopeless in Phase 4. All in all, I was really disappointed with the Yeti Sword's boss performance, so as it stands, the Spirit Scepter still remains on top. And then lastly, the Midas Staff. For both Phase 1 and Phase 2 clearing, this thing performed basically the same as in the clear. It was able to comfortably kill mobs, but the hitbox of gold blocks are very frustrating to deal with, and obstacles can quite easily block your shots and force you to recast the spell more often. The Midas Staff also quite literally cannot reach the Withermancers that sit on the top of the pillars in the Phase 2 part of the fight, so you're forced to use your LCM beam or any other ranged attack to get rid of them. Actual boss damage was very high as expected, so Crushing Storm was a breeze. However, similar to the Yeti Sword, this weapon completely falls off the moment you reach Goldor's Tunnel. The regular right-click ability completely misses Goldor, meaning that you have to rely on other range damage or the weak LCM beam, and because of this, he ended up getting over 3 quarters of the way through the tunnel before dying. I had basically given up in Phase 4 because I knew that this thing would be hopeless if it couldn't handle the tunnel, and as expected, you quite literally cannot hit Necron if he flies away too far. All in all, the Midas Staff was probably the largest disappointment due to its insanely high price point and requirements, which leaves the Spirit Scepter as the highest performing weapon for the Floor 7 boss fight. So now that we've finally covered all of the important tests for all of these mage weapons, let's start talking about their value after considering their performance, requirements, and their costing. First things first, let's talk about the Spirit Scepter, because this thing performed insanely well for a 15 million coin weapon that you unlock after Floor 4. Not only was it able to output solid damage numbers and reliable DPS, but it cleared like an absolute beast, and it was able to handle the Floor 7 boss fight from start to finish with no hiccups in between. Sure, it wasn't the strongest boss damage, nor was it the strongest at clearing Withermancers, but its consistency and reliability is honestly very admirable, which makes it an extremely strong contender as the ideal RCM mage weapon before you upgrade to a Necron's Blade. 
The Glacial Scythe is a weapon that I initially actually had really high hopes for, but after running my tests, I was really let down quite a lot. The best way that I can summarize it is it's just a worse but more expensive Spirit Scepter, because its clear wasn't as good as the Scepter, its mini boss damage wasn't as great either, and the boss DPS just sucked. Considering it's literally more than triple the cost of the Spirit Scepter, this thing is completely useless, and it does not make sense to upgrade from the Scepter into the Glacial Scythe at any point during progression. The Eddie Sword is still confusing me even after I've seen all the results, because on one hand, I kinda love how the weapon feels, but at the same time, I'm also very disappointed. In some cases, it acts like a budget Hyperion and can completely annihilate enemies with a few right clicks, but then you watch the Floor 7 performance and you sit there thinking, how the hell is this thing worth 65 million coins? All in all, because it had such a shocking performance in the Floor 7 boss fight, I can't really place it higher than either the Spirit Scepter or the Glacial Scythe, so as it stands, I'd say that this weapon is mostly pointless and should only be bought if you're really fond of being able to totally nuke random mobs in some rooms that show up during the clear. And then of course, we've got the Midas Staff. I also have some really mixed feelings on this weapon, but I think overall, I'd say it's pretty bad all things considered. Sure, it might deal upwards of 15 million single target damage, it might have incredible mini boss potential that deletes everything in your sight, it might have pretty solid clear that can deal with most mobs relatively well, but what it doesn't have is any form of decent damage to a mob that's literally 3 blocks off the ground. This thing failed miserably just like the Yeti Sword did when killing flying mobs, and it actually performed even worse in the phase 2 clear, because it couldn't take out the Withermancers that were sat on the elevated pillars. At the very least, the Yeti Sword can at least launch terrain onto the pillars and then kill those Withermancers, but the fact that the Midas Staff can't even reach them at all is pretty bad considering that it's worth 300 million coins. It also has a bit of a rough time clearing tight spaces in rooms with lots of corners, sharp turns, and obstacles in the way, and it's just not as consistent as something like the Spirit Scepter. However, the high damage numbers did get me thinking. If the Midas Staff is objectively miles better in terms of damage than the other weapons in this video, how would it fare in Master Mode? Can it clear well? Is it reliable for bosses? Is the 300 million coin price point actually justifiable because it might be useful in Master Mode? Well, I hate to break it to you, but at least with my main profile that I've already shown you, the footage on screen was one of my many attempts at getting this thing to work. The Midas Staff from my testing couldn't even clear M3 at all, and I'd just die to mini bosses or I'd get destroyed by surrounding mobs very quickly. Judging by how the Midas Staff performed and the weak damage from the other weapons in this video, I think it's safe to say that if you do want to tackle the early or even late Master Mode flaws, you're probably going to have to have a Hyperion by then because that's the only actually reliable weapon for the clearing. So then we come to the part of the video that everyone's been waiting for. Which upgrade should you buy? Which mage weapon should you go for before upgrading to a Necron Blade? Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like this question could be very easily reworded to which upgrade should you avoid? Because I think it's pretty safe to say that you shouldn't be buying anything that isn't a Spirit Scepter before you upgrade to the Hyperion. Overall, the performance of the other three weapons had their strengths and their weaknesses, but the Spirit Scepter stayed extremely constant the whole way through this video. It has very achievable requirements, it has a very achievable price point, its clear is phenomenal, its DPS is passable, and most importantly, it can reliably damage everything in the Floor 7 boss fight with no issues at all. As far as I'm concerned, the weapon progression for Mage should be something like an undungeonized Frozen Scythe, a Dreadlord Sword, or a Bonzo Staff in the early floors, and then once you get your hands on the Spirit Scepter, you can keep that thing all the way up until you reach the Hyperion. If you were considering spending any money at all to upgrade your stats, don't go buying a Midas Spoon or a Yeti Sword or even the Glacial Scythe. I think you're certainly better off just upgrading your talismans to increase your magical power, or even better yet, buy yourself a solid LCM weapon like the Bone Reaver or the Felthorn Reaper. Pairing the Felthorn Reaper and the Spirit Scepter for clearing is a deadly combo. Allowing you to completely annihilate mini bosses faster than even the Midas Spoon can, while still maintaining top tier clearing damage for everything else. That being said, when it comes to specifically RCM damage, the Spirit Scepter still remains better than everything else because it's just consistent, it does what you need it to, it's cheap, and it's really easy to get. 
So there we have it. The outcome to this video certainly wasn't one that I was expecting myself, but it's still an interesting one nonetheless. Hopefully you did find this video useful, enjoyable, or informative in some way, and if you did, consider subscribing to this channel as I will have a full updated weapon progression guide out soon, which will cover every class at every stage of the game, both in and out of dungeons. Either way, I've covered everything that I wanted to in this video, so I'll just catch you guys in the next one.